Hey. OSEL, welcome to Tara Institute and welcome everyone to OSEL's talk. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, as the traditional owned custodians of the land in which we stand, we welcome OSEL mm -hmm. for his talk you tonight. Should rise in, Hello everyone, so nice to see you. Um, it was a little bit tight, the schedule, so we, we couldn't make it earlier. I'm sorry for that. Um, it's very special to be here. Well, many, like it's hard to see all of you. <laughs> I think the last time I was here maybe it was, I was five or six. Is that correct? Two? Two? The last time was five or six. Yeah? Four, three? But I remember really well. <laughs> so it can't, be, it can't be three. Yeah, the second time? Five, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I remember making, baking cookies in the kitchen. I remember the park in front of the building. And there's some stairs, maybe they're not there anymore, I'm not sure. Were there some big stairs at the front? Are they gone? Oh, they're still there. Yeah, so anyways, it's been a long time, many years, how many years? Maybe 30, 32 years, 32, 33 years. And um, yeah, so hopefully, yeah, so uh, <coughs> we did um, one of the uh, retreats in uh, Bendigo Stupa recently. I'm seeing many, many people who were there before in that. <laughs> yeah, and um, so in New Zealand also we did one. It was uh, about four days and a half. It's good. So anyway, so this, uh, this talk was quite improvised. Uh, we didn't really make any kind of thought about what to talk about or anything like that. So I'm also very happy to take uh, subjects, if you want me to talk about certain subjects. Or else I can just talk about my life. <laughs> I don't know, uh, give me something. Patience. Patience, okay, I'll, I'll take notes, let's see. The, the Global Tree Initiative? Okay. I can, I'll talk about that, about that at the end. Okay, just so people remember. <laughs> okay, what else? Yes. Oh, I know you. <laughs> Glad you. How are you? Long time no see. Yeah, last time was Lama Tsongkhapa, no? So, what's your, what's your subject? Gratitude? How's Susanna? Did you see her? No? Gratitude. It's a great subject. Okay, what else? Is the 21st century any more significant than all the other centuries? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, what else? Your life? My life. Who said that? <laughs> All right, um, what else? Rapping. <laughs> yes? Peace. Sorry, what? Peace. Oh, peace. Wow. Inner peace or exterior peace? <laughs> Both? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Bring, yes? Bringing Dharma to modern society. Bring what? Bringing Dharma to modern to, society. Oh, bringing Dharma to bring Dharma. Yes. Um, 
been brought up by Western parents in the Dharma and the life experiences through that lens? Uh, Western parents? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I didn't really spend much time with my parents. Okay, the, how did that affect or yeah. the influence? Yeah. Okay. All right, what else? Sorry? Impermanence? I think there's one over there, right? Yeah? yeah. Impermanence. Spirituality and creativity. Do they go together? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> of course they do, right? Uh, so creativity and spirituality. Well, but what's spirituality? What does it mean for you? It means the inner, the inner union with the invisible world. Okay, Spir nice definition. Spirituality. Okay. Uh, maybe one more subject. Sorry? Calming. Calming the mind. Okay. That goes with peace, I guess. Calming. Yes. Maybe because you've learned a colorful life, um, how you've integrated Buddhism and Western psychology to help some of the mm. that. Integration, okay. Integration. All right. <coughs> I think it's pretty good. Yes. How to deal with uh, how to adapt positively, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Sangye chino sangye chino amla chando bardo dani kisu je dagi chisu gibe suno tuna pinje sangye do bara shu sangye chida sangye chino amla chando bardo dani. Sangye jinsu gibe sanam ge do la pinje sangye do ba sangye chila sangye chinam la chanjo pardo dani kipsu sangye jinsu gibe sanam ge do la pinje sangye do ba shu. Okay. So we start with patience. I think it's important because you all had to be so patient with me today. <laughs> um, so patience, what is patience? Patience really is the relationship we have, we have with ourselves. Really, how we relate to ourselves. How much space you give to yourself. That's really where patience starts. So if you, if you don't give yourself much space, um, the patience will not be there. Not for yourself and not for anybody else. So really the patience is something that will help you a lot in life, every day, in any situation. It's a very, very valuable um, aspect of our strength and power. So. If you don't have patience with yourself, in many different situations in life, you could end up in more difficult situation. Like for example, if you don't have patience, what happens? Sometimes anger can come in, right? So anger only comes in if you don't have patience. So patience is really the, the, the no patience is the door for the anger to, to jump in, right? And what is anger going to do? It will take over and uh, destroy. Because that's the job for, of anger, right? It's to destroy. So just the same way, it is very difficult to create. It is very easy to destroy. Um, sometimes something that takes maybe 20 years or more in one second can be destroyed. So really the value, even though in society, negativity is much more valued. The true value is uh, creating. Really, but then of course if you turn on the TV, it's all about destroying, right? <laughs> because that's the attention, the attention of people goes there. Because that's how you've been wired. You've been wired to give importance to negative things. 
So then what happens? Um, that's really what, the energy we give to that. A lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of attention, our space. See, the patients disappear there. So then what happens? And then you give a lot of attention to these aspects and then that's what's going to prevail in your life. And then of course, who do you have to blame? Only but yourself. Because really, it's not a choice, I mean, of, oh, you know, the circumstances happened to me this way, it's, it's not my problem. It really is an option of reaction. So you choose how to react. You know, you say, oh, I don't have option, it's, it's not my choice. It is, actually. It's your responsibility. Because um, it's very easy to, to put responsibility on others. And we tend to do that a lot by blaming, criticizing, judging, uh, comparing, discriminating, etc., etc., etc. So this way we don't have to focus on ourselves. We don't have to say, oh, look at me, what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, what I could do better. That's not so important anymore. Why? Because we're focusing on other people's defects. But they only become defects because we know we have them. Right? If you don't think you have a certain defect, then if, when somebody says, oh, you're this, you're that, it will not affect you. It only affects you because you think you have it, or you believe you have it. So, I mean, there are many examples, right? So that's why you, you take it personally. If you say, oh, I, I have it, you think, oh, maybe I have this defect, and then somebody says it, and then, oh, it affects you. But you don't, you, you're denying it. Out, outwardly, you're denying it. But inwardly, you're taking it personally because you believe it. So really what's happening in all this situation, it means that you're not giving space to yourself. So if you don't give space to yourself, you can't give space to anybody. And if you don't give space to other people, they cannot really communicate properly. Because for other people to communicate, you have to be able to listen, right? And uh, not listen to talk or listen to, uh, to, to answer, but listen to understand as a real listening. And of course, that's really all, all the good things come from that, you know, when you give space to yourself, to others. Of course, many bad things can come out also. <laughs> but uh, there is an opportunity, let's say, right, for you to see the other person, for the other person to see you. It takes time because we, we need practice, obviously. We, we are in a world, in modern society, it's uh, pretty hectic every day. And uh, we value, we, we don't value time so much, even though it seems like it. We're always looking at the time, right? But if we did value time, we'd, we'd take our time to do things. So, I mean, life can be very ironic, you know. We chase happiness by doing things we know are going to make us unhappy. And then when we are unhappy, we, we still act surprised. So, I mean, life is full of irony in that sense. And of course, if you don't have patience with yourself, then who are you going to have patience with? You cannot have patience with anybody. You can't, you can't say, oh, I lost patience with such and such person. Again, we're deflecting. Again, we're observing outside. In order not to look inside. And then what happens? And then we have a conflict inside. Because we know that we are responsible, we know we have a job to do, but we're not doing it. Because it's easier to be distracted by other people's behavior than one, on one's own. So I, this is a story, very nice story. I probably, some people already know the story. Of a story of a, somebody who's walking in the forest and a snake falls into the fire. And then he goes to save the snake. The snake bites him, so he lets go. Somebody else sees it. And the first guy, he picks up a stick and saves the snake a second time. Right? And the snake escapes, runs away. And then the first person says, why did you save the snake a second time if it bit you? Let it, let it burn, right? That's a, the normal way of thinking in society. So the first person, he answers, my instinct is to save the snake. The instinct of the snake is to bite me. But I won't allow the instinct of the snake to change my instinct. 
So it doesn't matter what behavior people do or have, you shouldn't change who you are. Because otherwise it's the same story of the person who's washing the dishes in the apartment, and then when other people don't wash, they get angry. You know, nobody told you to wash the dishes. You washed them because you wanted to. And then you, of course, you gave something expecting something. You expected others to act like you. Also participating, also, but you don't know the story behind other people. You know, we always think that everybody's going to see the world like we see it. But that's impossible. It's completely, uh, uh, I don't know what word to use. I want to use ridiculous, but maybe some people find it offensive. I don't know. But it is ridiculous. You know, you cannot think like that. If you thought, if everybody thought the same, we wouldn't have problems, right? <laughs> We'd all be of the same voice. And Buddha, Buddha wouldn't have to teach 84,000 teachings. He'd just say, Om, and that's it. <laughs> or maybe D. <laughs> so, who is it? I think Adele wanted me to talk about syllables. Where is Adele? I can't see her. Uh, is Adele? She's there. Okay, are you happy now, Adele? <laughs> So it's really, really easy, you know, to always look at outside and blame others. It's so easy. It's the easiest thing. That's why also many times it's easier to watch the news and, and feel sorry for humanity than actually do some inner work. And be like, okay, maybe I'm going to change my point of view, my attitude, my perspective, my reality. And maybe it can influence the collective memory, you know. It does exist. I mean, there's many things that even the scientists don't know about. The archaeologists don't know about, there's so many things. And then, of course, when they don't know, what do they say? They just come up with some idea, so that it's not obvious that they're ignorant. But of course, you know, that's pride. Pride is also an aspect that separates us a lot from others. The human connection disappears when you have a lot of arrogance. And what's the point, you know? I mean, what's the point? Oh, there's many things we give power and energy and time and space to, that they don't, the result of using those, those, what do you call it, those aspects of ourselves, you know, the result is not so beneficial, you know. I mean, take any, any of these low frequency destructive emotions. Unless, of course, you have to, you work in MMA or something like that. <laughs> you have to fight for a living. Then maybe, maybe in that case, a little bit of anger is good, I don't know. I wouldn't know. <laughs> but I think most of you don't fight in MMA, right? <laughs> so really, that's, I think it's super important always to, to focus on oneself and to be a true friend. What is a true friend? It's somebody that talks very good about you behind your back. And in front of you says what they think with, in a, with a constructive criticism. That's a true friend. Are you, I mean, most of us, we, we think maybe we are good, true friends. But then sometimes we, we miss a step. So that's why I have to check all the time, checking, 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 checking. Because uh, we have the three doors, obviously, you know, the mind, the speech, the body. But do we check all those three doors every day? Or do we check other people's three doors more than ours? This is, this is a question that we have to make. And um, so I think if we give ourselves enough space because we truly value time, then patience will always be there. Okay, so I think that maybe the first subject we covered. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, patience, I think, is really a big... Uh, a big issue in today's life, patience. Because we really, inside patience comes a lot, you know, like even sickness comes because of a lack of patience. You know, patience, uh, lack of patience creates stress. And stress creates many chemicals that do affect the body in a negative way. And um, even like, for example, eating meat, you know, there's a lot of stress created in the animals that you eat, if you want to think more in a personal level of me, my body, my health. You can think like that. 
if you don't have that feeling of maybe so much empathy for the other animals because you don't see them getting killed or, or the life they had. So even thinking like that, you know, you're eating the stress of our animals and that could affect you, right? Also that way of thinking is, is beneficial because, I mean, you, you use this concept of me, right? I. I want to have a good quality life, I want to have good company, I want to have health, I want to have time. But how do we spend the time? We sell our time for things that we, we can never buy it back, right? So, you, really, I mean, we live to work or we work to live? This is the question. Well, what do you, what do you really want in life? And the, how are you pursuing it? This is a question you have to ask yourself every day because we have so much pressure from society, you know? Peer pressure, family pressure, cultural pressure, traditional pressure. Uh, pressure. You, you really don't know. So it's coming many times we don't know. Like it's, so the subconscious can be stressed and maybe the conscious is not really aware. And we try to be authentic authentic, but many times we sell that authenticity in order to be accepted. And that can be a very big mistake. Because uh, really, what, what is society looking for? Society is looking for authenticity. If you look at any social media, all the videos that people are like looking at up and down are mostly people doing authentic <laughs> things, right? <laughs> uh -huh. So, and that's what really humanity is looking for, you know, the, the human connection. That's really, I mean, what is everything about otherwise, you know, what, what is life really about? I mean, you can, you can think, oh, you know, oh, I, I would like to have a nice car, but what is really, at the end of that line, what is the reason you want to have a car? It's for human connection. Why do people pay more money for a car than their own house? Human connection. I mean, it's a, a little bit twisted concept of human connection because the values in society are completely upside down. And that's why for some people, they prefer to sleep in a garage and drive a, a very expensive car than to have quality life. You know, because they need to show an appearance because they truly believe that society will only accept them if they have that appearance. And that already is a barrier in life, you know? And we have so many barriers like that we create and we believe in completely. Because really, why, why, what, is what, we are, what are we most attached to normally? Our ideas, right? The ideas we have is really what we are most attached to. And everything comes from those ideas. So the idea that if I have a nice car, people will love me or accept me or care for me or Whatever it is. Or if I have a good job, then I'll be able to show people or help people or, or, or maintain a family. Whatever it is, you know, these concepts that we accumulate during life based on the values of society that are in a way imposed on us through education and culture. So the, uh, this is really, I think Dharma is really helping us to, to turn that around a little bit. Because I think it's important. It's important to turn those values around. Otherwise, we, we create conflict, inner conflict, and then when we get sick, we don't know why we are sick. And then, oh, we, then we say, oh, it's the chemtrails. <laughs> I was fighting my neighbor because it was the chemtrails. Some special chemical made me violent. <laughs> Right? Easy to find excuse. I'm not saying they don't exist or they exist. It's not really my job to know. But um, I can tell you that uh, we find many excuses to justify our behavior every day. That I can tell you. I can guarantee you. And... Um, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I feel so lucky, you know, we have Geshe Toga here and also Geshe La. Geshe La has a very, very nice name. 
Sanjum Gombo, in Tibetan is a, we, it's a very special, important name, you know, so it's like, it's not a normal name you will hear, powerful name. Actually, Geshe La, we are from the same monastery, and we're neighbors already from in Siraje. So, yeah, I mean, so lucky Geshe Togala, you know, he's, I, have, I, I think maybe last time was 33 years ago I met him, probably. Who knows here? Lama Yeshe had very good connection with Geshe Toga. So I'm looking forward to seeing him now after the talk. I didn't get a chance to see him before because there's no time. We just came back from uh, Bendigo today in the afternoon. So that was really nice. Have you been to the stupa lately, anybody? It's, it's changed a lot. Well, it's pretty impressive. Oh, you've been to the stupa? Great, great. Yeah. Lots of kangaroos. <laughs> and trees, many trees. We actually planted 100 more trees in the, in the retreat, so that was nice. Hmm. Yeah, so the influence of society really changes our perspective completely. And then we base our lifestyle on that. And then we suffer and we don't know why. And then we blame it on, on something else. But uh, of course, the easiest aspect is to just not to take responsibility, to follow. Following is really the easiest aspect. There's nothing easier than that. But it's really the best way to complicate your life the maximum way possible. <laughs> so, when I say follow, I'm, I'm saying following something that you don't understand, really. What is it, the thing that you can really understand is what you have inside. Everything else, it's always changing, it's always, you know, very relative. Let's say it's a little bit like your reputation. <laughs> you don't really have much control on your reputation, right? Today some people like you, tomorrow maybe they don't like you. You can't really know why. Maybe it's they have issues in their life and then because they have issues, their perspective of who you are changes. And then because we think we are the center of the universe, we're like, oh me. You know, he said this, she said that, or she didn't say this, or he didn't say that. Who knows? We love to complicate our life. So really, what we can understand is what's happening inside. But we have this tendency of not wanting to check too much. Because when we check, then that's when all the other stuff starts coming out. It becomes a little bit overwhelming. And, and then we're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's too much work. But really, that's what Dharma is helping us with, and that's why we, for example, in this case, I mean, this used to be a church, but in general, the golden rule in all religions is a good heart, is a kind heart, is a warm heart, right? The compassion. So that's really the golden rule. Between all religions, all spiritualism, or, you know, anything that starts with the concept of trying to understand our purpose in life. So it starts with the same concept. And that's why, you know, we all have that here because we have that interest. If we are here, it's because we have that interest. We want to understand or see or have some idea of how to improve our life, how to make it more productive, as you say in capitalistic words. How to be more productive, right? <laughs> how to make more money. But really, if you think about it, it's, it's probably much more realistic to be enlightened than to become a millionaire. <laughs> think about it. Because really, you know, the concept of millionaire is like, oh, when I have, then I will be happy. When, you know? So we're always searching for the destination, for the, for the what do you call it? The, um, the, the, the end game, right? The destiny. That's what we're looking for. But we don't realize that actually, what we're looking for is the journey, the process. That's really what, what, what we're living, you know, that's many times, I mean, not many times, always, that's how it is. When you climb Mount Everest, or you prepare to climb Mount Everest for a long time, when you get to the top, what, what do you do? Go back down, right? <laughs> so, or, or the top of a mountain is the bottom of, of the next mountain. So it's not really about, there is no destiny. I mean, yes, the only certain thing in life is that we will die, right? So you can call that a destiny, but of course that's life after death. So there is a continuation. Oh, thank you so much.
زر شو بیارم شو می آی نید کافی سوری It's been a long day. So really, you know, for example, another example. We have, we have a lot of fear of death, for example, no? <laughs> we have a lot of fear for death. But, um, but really we walk like we're immortal every day. You know, you wake up and you believe, you act completely, 100% you're immortal. Until maybe there's some problem in the body, and then you remember the body. But until that happens, you, you don't really, there's not much gratitude for the body. Only when the body does not respond properly or comes up with, it's not, it's not really the problem. The body is not saying, oh, I don't like you, look what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> the body is trying to communicate, but we just don't have time to listen to it. It doesn't seem important, just like maybe the sunrise is not important. Or how the wind makes the trees dance. Who cares, right? You see it every day. <laughs> Wait till there's no more wind. And then the day you see it, it's going to be like, wow. Anyways, just food for thought, right? And uh, yeah, it's just the way you see how the perspective, the attitude, you know, the state of mind. If you can change that, then many things will change in your life. Like an example, you can th say, oh, some people, they, they, they don't like uh, skulls. In Tibetan culture, there's a lot of skulls. You know, we have skull mala, skull this, skull that. The deities, we have many skulls. So sometimes people, they don't like skulls. You know, they're like, oh, skulls is bad. Hey, wh why is it bad? Is it because it represents death. It's like, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe it represents the acceptance of death. And maybe when you accept death, that's when you start to live for real. Right? As long as you're afraid of death, oh, death is coming, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this, oh, maybe I shouldn't go there, oh, should. you're scared, this fear blocks you. So you're not really alive. You're more dead than alive, actually. You're already like waiting for death to come and take you. you know, so the moment you, you say, okay, death is part of life, you accept it, then suddenly you, you, that fear disappears. And that's when you start living for, sh for real, right? Does that make sense? So there's many things like that in life that you can turn around the perspective. Easy. So what's, what's blocking it? It's the ego, right? The, the ego that doesn't exist. <laughs> the concept you say, oh, me, 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 but where is the me? There's no me. There's never any me. Because uh, if there was me, maybe, you know, maybe life would be different would actually think about people in a different way. If the me was real, maybe the compassion would be very easy to have compassion. But because the me is not real, the I that you think, that you identify with, is not really you, that compassion is very hard to get. It's a little bit like the patience with oneself or with another person. So, if you want to find the real me, is a, is a me that is you are compassionate about the kindness me, you know that's a real me. The other one is a, the the you could you could call it maybe the survival me. <laughs> the one that says, okay, I have to protect this body at all costs. You know, I mean, our ancestors were really good at that. Our ancestors were very, very highly, highly, highly intelligent, super intelligent. Not that, not like us. Not like us, we are not so intelligent. Um, we wouldn't be able to survive. We wouldn't be able to survive if we had to survive today like our ancestors. Impossible. If you drop any of us, I don't know, maybe there's some people who know how to survive, but most of us, you drop us in the forest, or maybe Peter Stripes, he can survive. <laughs> <laughs> if you drop anybody in the forest, uh, after three days, maybe, <laughs> we go crazy. No phone? Oh, yeah, yeah, don't, don't forget that, there's no phone. So without the phone, how, I mean, already at night, I mean, in Australia, I think it's even more, to, more difficult to survive. These uh, wild animals, right? The, if the spider doesn't bite you, the, the snake will finish, finish you off. 
If that's not enough, then the frog will come. <laughs> Jump on you. <laughs> you know, actually, I haven't seen any, any yes, poisonous animals the, the whole time I was in, in New Zealand. So. I'm in New Zealand, Australia. Tomorrow where? In your house. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <sighs> anyway, so f when you start to have the real bodhicitta mind, the real compassionate mind towards inside, that's where you can really start to find who you are. You know, otherwise the ego is just a construction, you know. And it's reinforced by the society, you know, by the programming, by the education. Already from childhood, you know, the first word you learn is mama, papa, mine, my mama, papa, my papa, right? Mine. The first concept the kid makes in his word is already possessive. I mean, of course, you, there's many debates on that, about emotional connections and emotional stability for the child who's growing, etc., etc. But from a Tibetan uh, Buddhist perspective, already you're creating that, that uh, imprint, right? For suffering. And what do you call it? The, um, the chupete. How do you say that in English? <laughs> what the, yeah, what they put for the babies too. Dummy? Yeah. Dummy. So, like the dummies already, for example, were in. Huh? Choo choo? <laughs> so, that, for example, in the hospital where my son was born, completely illegal. Is, is a contraband. If they catch you with that, you're in big trouble. Because it's it's the concept of that is not, doesn't help, you know, it's creating an addiction, a need, an already grasping kind of concept. And many times uh, when, when the kids don't have enough milk from the mother and they have that alternative, it, does, it can create certain addictions in the future when they grow up. Not always. But it's just ideas and concepts to understand so that you can start relating your mind to your attitude and your perspective and understand why and how that result came to be. So there's many, many aspects like that in life. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So then when you think me, already you relate to the person from that aspect. So if that the person is suffering, you don't see the person. You only see how they insulted you. Insulted, I mean, who cares about insulting you or not, right? But we care so much about what they say to us, but we don't care why they said it. We actually have a true concept of I, with the compassion. Then whatever anybody says will never affect us. It, it's impossible. How can it affect us? It's not for us. It's about them. It's their way of expressing their pain and their conflict. So we can't see that. Then we have a problem. Already we have that separation because of the arrogance. That's why humility is a huge value, Im immensely practical value that really, really can give us so much quality life. You know, people think, oh, I'm not going to be humble because people will think I'm weak. Yeah, sometimes that can happen. For some people, you do have to communicate in a certain way. You have to speak their own language a bit. Otherwise, they can eat you up, right? <laughs> but always with compassion and peace or space. Patience, same. So when somebody talks to you in a certain way, if you give importance to wanting to understand the person, then you see their, their pain. And when you see their pain, then everything else gets deflected. Nobody can harm you with words. There's a very beautiful story of the Buddha where somebody was insulting him in public, trying to make him react, and, and he didn't react, he wouldn't react. So in the end, the guy, he gives up, and he asks him, how did you manage to ignore all my insults? And the Buddha, he answers with a question. He says, if somebody brings you a present or a gift and you don't accept it, who keeps the gift? So it's, it, that applies to this example. You know, if somebody shouts at you or says something, maybe even with the intention to harm you, to hurt you, but you observe more and give more importance to the, to the 
issue of that person or the reality that that person is suffering and is expressing themselves in the way that they know how to express themselves. Because maybe they have a pain, they have a conflict, they don't know how to get it out. So nobody has taught them. Education teaches you how to work, but doesn't really teach you how to live. So really it's up to the parents to help you, but sometimes even the parents don't really know. So anyway, so these, they, all this is food, food for thought, you know. That's going to help you improve your life. Humility is going to help you improve your life. Why? Because when you have humility, you enjoy forgiving. And when you enjoy forgiving, it becomes so easy. And, and it really saves you so much time and weight and heaviness. Somehow we are addicted to suffering. We are addicted to carrying a weight that's not ours. But somehow, even the other person made a big mistake, we cannot forgive them. And then we carry the mistake they made. And I know many people who, who live like that. Anyways, um, it's becoming a little bit depressing now. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> looks so sad. <laughs> Okay, so let's go move on to gratitude, which I think is a huge, huge uh, subject, really. Actually, uh, the hack experiences or hack retreats, we changed the name now to experience. But um, the main, how you s we start everything is with gratitude. Because in the text, in the Tibetan texts, I'm trying to move this table because, yeah, I know. To move back. So I can't see you much because the microphone is on the left. So every time I turn, but anyway, it should be fine. Yeah, it's, it should be fine. I can do like this. <laughs> <laughs> so we really, in the Tibetan text in general, the uh, gratitude, the, the medita like the gratitude concept is not really mentioned too much. It's more like a Western idea. It's no, not Western. I mean, Westerners like it more, you can say. Tibetans don't find it so important. Because that it's included in the prayers already, when you do the prayers. But for the Westerners, it's not it, it, doing it in prayers is maybe not enough. You know, it's just reciting it is not enough. We have to do the gratitude meditation, right? <laughs> because really, for for I think the Westerners, we have it much more wired. This this concept of me and the problems that comes with the me. In a, a Eastern Eastern culture, it's more of a collective. So really. The problems of the individual is not so important. The harmony of the collective is really the important aspect. Thank you so much. Thank you. In the Western psychology or collective, really, I mean, sorry, the Western um, culture is more of an individualistic way of thinking. So the me is very important, I. My problems are much more important than your problems, right? <laughs> so when somebody in the West, they say hello, they will maybe if they have some, how are you? They will say, oh, I'm not so well. This happened, that, this is problem, that problem, blah, 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 blah. So if the other person is happy, maybe they will also come down. They'll be like, oh, you know, also come down. In the East, if somebody says, how are you? Maybe you have many problems, but you're like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Very good, very good, very good day. Ha, 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 ha. Then other person, oh yeah, me too, ha, 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 ha. Then suddenly your problems disappear, become more light. You know, because why you're more, you, it's more important the other person than your problems. So your problems become secondary. But of course, there is pros and contrasts for both aspects, like everything in life. Everything is gray, there's no black, there's no white. Okay? Everything has its good aspect and bad aspect. In a dualistic world, conventional perspective, okay? So, you really want to start with gratitude. You want to start with gratitude. And um, so just remember, you know, the, the, sorry, I wanted to finish that. In the collective community, because the individual's problems don't important, they're not so important, Sometimes it can be very deep psychological problems because people don't tend to talk about their problems. I've seen that. But in Western, in Western culture, it's different because people tend to talk about their problems so much. 
that the problems become so big and they cannot find a solution. They go into this loop, into a cycle. And that's how habits work. We are creatures of habit, you know, so we really have to be careful with that. I'll very, very careful. It's very easy. Because really, that's how we are designed. The more you do something, the easier it is. Karma talks about that, you know. If you create the karma to be a bad person, you will be reborn in a situation where it will be easier to create that karma. So if you, like, you're born as a tiger, you have to kill in order to survive your whole life. So it's, every time it's easier for you. You're born in a neighborhood where there's gangs, and as a child you already have to, you know, join the gangs and, and, and ha do like activity, gang activity, whatever it is, uh, in order to be accepted or, you know, to survive. And if you create good karma, right, good imprints, good memories like that, then you, you create the cause for that to be easier to do. So habits. So whatever applies in this life can apply to the future lives, you know. You really, you just have to expand the concept. Because this life really, all, all the past is here and all the future comes from here, right? So really, this is what we got. We have this right now. So it's good to balance it out, you know. In, in, the, in the West, it's all about me, 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 too much me. But also, it's good to get things out, you know. So you really have to find the balance between two cultures or between anything, you know. You find one extreme, you find the other extreme, and you find the middle way. It doesn't mean you have to go and do all the extremes, okay? Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's thinking, oh, great, <laughs> I can do all the extremes now. No. That's up to you, obviously. Um, but yeah, that's, I think it's an important uh, aspect to understand, you know, between cultures. Many things change between cultures, between languages. So in the Tibetan culture, gratitude is included in the prayers, but not so much in the meditation. So for the Westerners, I think it's, it's interesting to include that. Because uh, there's a lot of attachment, there's a lot of fear, you know, and with gratitude that disappears. When you have gratitude for what you have, you have everything. You don't need anything anymore. Because when you think, oh, I want, I don't have, then you're not grateful. You're not living the present. You're not here. You're somewhere else. And most of the time, somewhere else, it doesn't exist. Or will never exist, actually. That's why idealization is very dangerous. When you idealize, you're creating the cause to be very disappointed, you know, because you get so attached to that idea, which is just a projection on top of an interpretation and another interpretation. So it's a completely different story. So when you are gra grateful, then you're like, okay, I have everything now. Now I have everything, right? I have everything. So you think like that, and then you have everything. And then you don't need anything. You don't need anything. And you're not fearful of losing anything either. And uh, whatever, whatever you want, you already have, you know. So if you start in the morning with that gratitude meditation, you start being grateful for your body, for all the sentient beings in your body working tirelessly for you every day, all the time. Your heart doesn't stop beating for your whole life. Do you even remember your heart? <laughs> Only makes sense because boom, 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 boom. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have a heart attack now. Then <gasps> the heart, suddenly you remember. It's been there since you're two weeks old, fetus. It's been pumping blood. So really, if you want to focus on things, focus on things like that. You know, be grateful for what you have, for what there is, not for the, what you would like or what you wouldn't like. Or, you know, all these concepts that really are completely useless in our head. It's just, you know, clatter. In the garage, if you have a, full, a garage full of things, you know, until you don't take things out, you can't bring any new things. If your hand is closed, you can't give away, you can't receive. If your hand is open, you can receive, you can give. This is a very funny joke. A guy, he was so, so miserly, he was so miserly, he was drowning. And then somebody gave him to, like the hand and he said, give me your hand, give me your hand. The miser, he was drowning, drowning, he was for sure going to die. And then the servant, he understands, he's like, oh, he's so miserly, he doesn't want to give me his hand. So he said, take my hand, and then took his hand. <laughs> able to save him. <laughs> so even to save his own life, he didn't want to give his hand, you know? 
I mean, probably it's quite exaggerated story, but it's a metaphor, you know? Or like the story of the, of the two mice, that where if one fall, they fall into a bucket of, of milk, and then they can't get out, so one give, gives up, one mouse gives up, he, he dies. And the other mice doesn't give up, and he keeps trying to get out the whole night. And he churns the milk. And then he, he was, he's able to walk away in the morning. Churn, you say, churn? Churn, yeah. So that's another metaphor also, you know, f about life. So, it's very easy to be like, oh, you know, you go to the gym, oh, I'm going to go two weeks, I'm going to make big muscle like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Then I'm going to say, you punch like a vegetarian. <laughs> you didn't know that saying in the movie? It's terrible, terrible. <laughs> All the vegetarians are angry at him now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting how society and the system tends to divide people, you know. And we always find a way to divide, you know, to, to take, you know, really it's not about dividing, it's about uniting, you know. So be careful with that. Be very careful with that. But, um, if you go to the gym, and uh, you, in two weeks you want to make big muscles, and then after two weeks you don't have much result and you give up. Uh, that's not really dedication, right? That's not constancy. So really, the mind works exactly the same way. You want to be able to train the mind and, and have see some kind of result. But for the Westerners, we want to see results really fast. So then, of course, just meditation is not enough. We need to be, a, to, a, to be able to apply that. We have to apply it somewhere, somehow. So really, one of the most practical ways, I think, is to be able to adapt positively right, to any situation. That really is what Dharma is helping us with. So how to do that? First step, change your perspective. So anything bad happens, try to see the positive aspect. Focus on that. Feed what you want in your life. You want something good, you feed good. You want something bad, negative, you feed that. But don't blame others for that when you have that. Be aware. Hmm. So once you change your perspective, if you start with the, the concept of humility, you know, you give yourself space, you give yourself time, you know, that patience will come. You have the humility, you can forgive, even if you're wrong, I mean, sorry, even if you're right, you can still forgive. At least you give the space and the opportunity for the person who's wrong to forgive. You know, because, cause like for example, some, I, I say being, climb, being on top of the donkey. So the, that's just a metaphor of saying, oh, no, I'm right. You know, this, because you did it, da, 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 da. Then the other person climbs on the donkey too, and then both are fighting. Nobody wants to get off the donkey. You know, so even if it's one is right, one is, is wrong, it doesn't matter. Just the fact that you're fighting to be right is not giving the opportunity for the other person to forgive or be forgiven. So even if you're right, you say, okay, okay, you, you know, yes, I'm sorry. How many times has this happened? I've had this experience many times. It doesn't mean I'm always right, huh? <laughs> so I say, I say, I'm sorry, or the other person says they're sorry, even though they're right. And after some time, the person who was wrong and did not want to recognize it will say, actually, I'm also sorry. It was my mistake, or whatever it is. And how good does that feel? But then you don't have to say, you see, I told you, no, no, <laughs> no. It's not to do that. You know, it's to, it's to really, and that makes you feel so good. Because always you leave open energetic lines, you know. Good night. You, give, you leave open energetic lines. Like what do you call it? Cabos sueltos, we say in Spanish. How do you say in, sorry? Loose ends, loose ends. Energetic loose ends. And that's, uh, that drains so much, so much. You have no idea. Some people can't sleep at night because of that. And they don't know why. It's because they're thinking, 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 thinking. 
And, and I actually enjoy it at the end. I mean, enjoy it. Because something sometimes, for some people, is enjoy. I mean, we are kind of masochists in a way. If you look at our lifestyles, you know, what, what do you really value? What kind of life quality, what do you really want to do in your life? I don't think none of us really think about that. We just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, and have an idealization we're grasping to. But really there's nothing there, because when we get there, we realize it was all about the journey. And then we're like, oh no, I should have done, I should have gone here, I should have gone there, I should have done that, I should have hugged this person, that person, I should have said sorry to this person, that person. I should have called my mom, I should have called my dad, blah, 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 blah. But uh, of course it's never too late, but it's always too early. No, it's never too early, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's never too early. It's never too late. It's never too early. So, I think really adapting, adapting positively is really there. Is starting with your perspectives, changing that, changing the perspective, and stop looking outside all the time, and really thinking about and questioning yourself: What do I want to be? So there's a beautiful saying because some people they they're searching for the for the love of their life, right? The perfect love. People are searching for that their whole life. But actually, what is the job? Is to become that. That's really what you're looking for. But you don't know. We think, oh, it's somebody outside there. But nobody, you cannot really apply that to anybody because everybody is different in a way. The perspective, their ideas. So we'll always find defects if we want. And we'll always find positive aspects if we want. So that's why the perspective is so important. Become the person you want to love for the rest of your life. Become the person you want to fall in love with. It's very simple. That's what Dharma is saying. In a more Western, fluffy kind of way. <laughs> I say fluffy because some people will think like that, you know. But it's not really fluffy. I mean, it's just we do have an aversion for vulnerability. So the vocabulary has created words for those people. But I think vulnerable is important because if you don't become, if you don't make yourself vulnerable, it's very difficult to feel love or loved. But sometimes we make ourselves vulnerable in the wrong situations, in the wrong circumstances or conditions. So you do have to be very careful with that, okay? <laughs> Anyways, there's so much to talk about actually and so little time. What time is it? Where is it, 10? Maybe we can do 15 minutes more and then it's because it's the children. How, what time do you go to sleep normally? You don't know your feet. <laughs> wow, lucky. You know, huh? Oh, you don't know. Right. So my son, you know, when he was three years old, I would tell him all the time, I'd be like, you're so lucky, nobody expects anything from you. You're such a lucky child. Because for me, when I was a child, many people expected many things from me. So uh, he would be like, okay, dad, okay, dad, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then after maybe, I don't know how many times I must have said it to him. I must have said it many times. Like, not all the time, every day, but once, it, well, once every so often I would say that, you know, like, you're such a lucky kid, you know, nobody expects anything from you. You're free to do whatever you want in your life. And one day he looked at me really seriously and he said, Dad, shut up. <laughs> and I was like taking aback. I was like, wow, what, what, you know, because my son normally, he's a very kind person. He's so super kind. So I'm like, whoa, what happened? <gasps> I must have done me. I must have done something wrong, right? So then I actually, I just, I just thought about it. I really thought about it very deeply. And then I understood that I expected him to be grateful for not expecting anything. <laughs> so I was making the same mistake. But of course, um, until he didn't get fed up, I didn't realize. You know, he's, but that's the thing, kids will say what they think without any filters. And that's why adults, they need to learn from kids sometimes, you know. We think we have so much to teach them. <laughs> we even think we're more intelligent than animals. Animals can follow the magnetic, man, magnetic fields and, and travel for thousands of kilometers. Fish and, 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 and birds. 
uh, find one human who can follow the, uh, the Earth's magnetic lines. What do you call it? The method. What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With his rods. <laughs> What do you call it? A magnetic line? What do you call it? What's it called? No, the mag no. electromagnetic lines. So that's what the animals they follow that. Right, Kike? Electromagnetic lines? I'm not a scientist, so I, I get uh, very confused with the words. But there is a certain magnet electromagnetic field in, from the Earth that animals are able to follow for thousands of kilometers and reach the destination. And we know it because we, we see it through watch, observing nature. Human has always learned things observing nature. Be it the way to dress, the way to dance, you know, what to eat, what not to eat, how to live, where to live, how to escape, how to even how to fight. You know, some of the Kung Fu, you know, the crane, the monkey. You know, the, the, we learn so much from animals. And then we, on top of things, we think animals are stupid. Come on. Who is really stupid? The one who doesn't know and assumes? Assume, you say, right? Just because animals don't talk our language doesn't mean they're stupid, right? But this is a problem, you know? Not problem, actually. This is a solution. You tr switch the word problem to solution. And uh, so humans, we tend to want to force everything to adapt to us constantly. And we don't want to adapt to nature. So we, ad um, we force nature to adapt to us completely. And then on top of that, we're still unhappy. And uh, an animal, when he wakes up, he doesn't need toothpaste. He doesn't need a pillow. He doesn't need a blanket, a, a mattress, windows, a roof, a car, a, what else, a clothes, every day, different clothes. All these aspects they don't need. You know, they adapt to nature. There are humans that adapt to nature on Earth, but they're very few, and they're not very respected. I mean, now, yeah, a little bit more, but for many years, just be, that's why, you know, the humans, they see humility as weakness. So, anyways, that's a whole different subject, but I did want to touch on that just a little bit, because I think it's important for us to start to really value, you know, and to understand that we are just, we're universal beings. An invisible, invisible frontier does not differentiate us. You know, and who has more money or, or, or one from the other doesn't dif really. I mean, if there's no food, no water, money is not worth absolutely anything. Maybe for fire. That's it. So really, uh, the values, you know, we really have to start to focus. What is it that is really valuable today for us every day? So the, the outside goals, you cannot take it with you. Uh, you always have to work to get more. You're always fearful that somebody's going to steal it from you. And uh, these problems when you die, maybe in inheritance, people fight, family members fight, they don't talk to each other for the rest of their life. So there's a lot of problems with the outside, the exterior goals. But then the inner gold, when you share it, it multiplies. The more you share, the more it multiplies. You don't have to worry, nobody can steal it from you. Right? When you die, you take it with you. Now that's the inner values, the inner goals. That's really what we want to, um, we want to grow. But somehow in society, they say, oh no, this person who has trillions and still doesn't take care of the people who work in the factories, who thanks to them, he's a trillionaire or whatever, a billionaire, I don't know. Even he, that person, cannot take care of the workers who are, thanks to them, he's like that. And still people idealize this concept. Wow, he's this, I want to be like that person. What's the point? You know, if, if that person cannot share even a little bit for the people who've actually got him to where he is, that really represents how the values are upside down. And on top of that, the humanity idealizes. Wow, this is so awesome. You know, to exploit people <laughs> and then act really arrogant. <laughs> wow, I want to be like him someday. He must be so happy. And seriously, I mean, it, now it sounds fam funny when I talk about it, but if, if you look at any magazine, look at Forbes, open Forbes. Why do people even pay for that magazine? 
or want to be on that magazine. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going away from this subject. But this is uh, sub what you asked me, right, about adapting positively. So once you find the values that help you to really create a, a positive perspective in your life, then your attitude will change. And that attitude will be a very easy, self-adapting attitude. It will be like water. When you, wherever you put the water, that water will take the form of that vessel. The water will always be able to come back to its initial form of purity. Always. However dirty or polluted it becomes. And water will always offer life unconditionally. Water will never say, oh, I'll give you some water and, and quench your thirst, but you have to give me something in exchange. <laughs> right? That's, doesn't, that's not water's nature. It's not one of its qualities. So if you can slowly mold your mind to become like water, or at least have the qualities of water, then already you start to change your perspective and your attitude. And your quality of life will really start to become much better. And also the people around you, they will start to be much happier. Right? I mean, we want to be happy, but we don't think about not being unhappy. We just think about being happy and we just want to jump. The not being unhappy part. <laughs> and then we become unhappy and we're like, why can't I be happy? Because everything is temporary. Suffering is temporary, happiness is temporary. But we get so attached. That we, when we are happy, we are thinking about, oh, it's going to end. Or I want more. Or it's not enough. So anyway, so just, you can think about all these things. I can talk all day, but it's not going to do much if you don't really try to apply it. You know, otherwise, it's a complete waste of time. So... Anyways, um, so bringing Dharma to society, um, I mean, it's not just about Dharma, it's really about the values, you know, so if we, tr if we bring, I really believe that education is the future, right, so if we're able to educate properly, not just the children, when we say education, we think about children, no, I mean, we're all being educated every day, the person who thinks I know doesn't know anything. Because the moment you come through the door, you have to be learning to know wh where not to step. You know, otherwise you're stepping on everybody. Right? You, you have, you're learning where this person is, that person is. You're learning where there's a space to sit. Right? If I, if I, when I came in, if I wasn't learning, I wouldn't know how to sit on the sofa. Right? So this is the concept of learning. It's not about, oh, I, re I read a book, now I know more than you. I'm more important. I'm superior. It's not about that. It's not all about that, really. Learning is about understanding every day and applying that. And of course, understanding that what we're learning is not real. It's just based on memory. In order for us to be able to relate to our reality. So, the memory, if you have Alzheimer's, you can't even open the door. Because you don't remember what the door is. So, of course, that's why it's so important to observe the habits based on memory. The way we interpret things what we project on those interpretations, how attached we get to those ideas, how we try to impose those ideas on others. Because we really feel we have the right, because we think we're superior, because maybe we're all Dharma practitioners, or whatever it is. I don't care. Really, I don't care. For me, all that I care is about your attitude, and how you treat people, how you relate to yourself, how you relate to others. That's what I care. That, for me, is what makes you a Buddhist. Otherwise... <laughs> What's the point, you know? You're just bypassing. You're creating a bypass. You're convincing yourself you're a Buddhist, or I'm a good person, in order not to have to really do that work, you know, to confront yourself. So that's why, you know, it's, it's something that we have to do daily. Okay? And really what are we looking for is, is to be recognized, to be accepted, to have a, a, a purpose, right? To be valued within society or the tribe. So that's what we really want. We want a human connection, starting with us. And that's everything, everything in social media, everything in life, 
all the religions, it's all based on human connection. And we just go to all the places, to objects, to this, to idealizations, to blah, 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 blah. It's all about human connection. All we're really trying to do is connect with ourselves so we can connect with others. That's it. You know, it's all about sharing and caring. At the end of the day, when people are about to die, that's what they most um, regret, not having connected with people, not having connected with themselves. Steve Jobs, I don't know what, what was his net worth, but I think it was like six billion or something like that. And I mean, we don't even know what that means. <laughs> but uh, he, even he didn't know what it meant because he had pan pancreas cancer and it didn't matter at all. And he himself said it, you know, all that fame, all that power, all that influence, all those properties and wealth and information and blah, 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 didn't mean, mean anything when he was confronted with death. And nobody or anything could save him. At least that's what he thought. Because, of course, you do close yourself off. Money does, does actually close you off, you know, so... There's people who have money who are happy, and people who don't have money who are happy as well. People who have money who are unhappy, and people who don't have money who are unhappy. So really, money is not really the important aspect, even though society and the system may make us believe that. I mean, there is a part of it that's important for us to eat and, and live, but we don't live to work. We work to live. So remember that. minutes okay okay so I'll start wrapping it up I mean I wanted to talk about more things but I'll have to come back I guess <laughs> um, okay so creativity creativity spirituality and the invisible world wow <laughs> I think creativity is really really important you know we when the moment we start fearing so if we want to be accepted and then we think that if we make mistakes, we won't be accepted. So we start creating a fear of making mistakes or making a fool out of ourselves or whatever it is. People don't really care in the end. We think people care so much, but they don't. Uh, people just care about themselves. Um, so when we start having fear of making mistakes, we really start shutting down the creativity. And we stop thinking out of the box. And uh, normally children up to 8 to 9 years old, most of them are 5 to 98% genius. Geniuses, most of them. But as they start having fear of, of, of not being creative, I mean, sorry, fear of making mistakes, they begin to not be creative. And then that genius level just falls straight down. But that doesn't mean that we can't recover it. You know, I think we all are geniuses and can be geniuses. And that's what really what Tantrayana is talking about, you know, and, and phys uh, quantum physics or neuro neuroscience is talking about uh, visualizing the result, right, becoming the result. So any athlete, before uh, any good athlete, before starting any kind of race or anything, what do they do? They do a meditation. They visualize themselves winning. You know, it's also tested. You can also not go to the gym. You just visualize you go to the gym. You lift weights every day, you gain muscle. Maybe not like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but something will happen. You know why? Because the power of the mind is so powerful, so powerful. That's why we really have to be careful what we think. Really have to be careful. So that can change your whole reality. You know, this is saying in English, be, watch, watch what you wish for. It may happen. So... Um, we don't have to have so much fear for things, you know, because fear really is a blockage. I mean, fear is okay when we have to fight or flight, a fight or flight response, right? For that, sometimes fear is useful. But in general, fear is really a blockage for us to be free. We want to be free. We don't want to be stuck in a box. We already, we were born in a box. We live in a box. We study in a box. We sleep in a box. When we die, they put us in a box. So there's a lot of boxes already in our life. Even our shoes, we have to, I mean, our feet, we have to put them in, in boxes. So, yeah, it's good to, to come out of the box, think out of the box, because that will really give you more adaptive flexibility, you know, the more you think out of the box. Always be ready to learn new things. Don't fear the unknown. 
because that's really going to limit you a lot. And um, yeah, spirituality, what is spirituality? Spirituality is having a good, good connection with yourself and, having, uh, and being able to have a good connection with others by applying those techniques, those universal techniques that maybe Buddha taught or many other great masters taught. So, oh, beep, beep. <laughs> so 21st century, what is more important? 21st century, in all, of, all of the centuries? I think that's a great question, you know? Because that's the type of mind that thinks, oh, now is not so important. The more important must have been yesterday or tomorrow. I mean, of course, it's always for everybody in history, it's now has always been the moment where they were alive. If you think about it, up to now, there's only, up to now, in all of the time, there has only existed about 200 billion humans in total, ever. 200 billion. That's nothing. That's nothing. Compared to the possibilities of genetics, all the humans that can be created. So each of us is like really a miracle. Because it's almost literally impossible for that personality or that person to exist within the possibilities of human of, of a human, you know, if up to now only 200 billion humans have existed, and the possibilities of of humans is infinite, the versions, the versions of each human is infinite. Who we are today and now is impossible, literally. That's why they say life is a miracle. Scientifically, it's impossible. So that's why you know in the text also it says, the human rebirth is almost as impossible as a turtle that comes out every, I don't know, every eon. So what, what is an eon? It's the, the life and death, the span or life of, of a star, right? That's an eon. So in one eon, there's one turtle that comes out to breathe the air in the middle of the big ocean. And exactly that moment, there's a, a ring, a wooden ring floating on the ocean. And the turtle, exactly the head goes through that ring. That's how difficult it is to have a human rebirth. It's written in the text, and the scientists say exactly the same thing. Well, very similar percentage, literally impossible for us to be born. So that's why we really have to be grateful and use the time. And when I say use, I'm not saying, oh, you know, stop working, go to the, to the jungle, and now live like a hippie barefoot. I'm not saying about that. <laughs> what I'm saying is apply, right? Whatever mm, tools that you get, apply them in everyday life. So really, if you're able to enjoy work, then you can really be a happy person. That's this amazing secret, you know? And if you don't enjoy it, maybe you start thinking about really what you want to do in life because, you know, even though fear may block you because you don't know what may happen, sometimes it is necessary, you know, to break free from your own ideas in your mind. Because what's outside there is really different. It's not the same. Because you, we, we look at the time, right? I see the time. So the eyes interpret. Then the brain interprets again second time. Then I project on that. And then based on my memory and all my stuff inside. So really what I'm seeing and what I'm getting attached to is not really what's there. It has nothing to do. So think about that, okay? And um, I think, yeah, that's, that's about it. So anyways, thank you so much. Thank you.